Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is March 22nd, 2023, and I'm going to continue my study of Christ's letter, letters to the seven churches today. Today we're at the Church of Sardis, and this video is called Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. In Revelation 3, verse 1, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches, and the seven spirits of God, I believe, represent the Holy Spirit. In Isaiah chapter 11 verses 1 and 2 we read this, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of I am shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Now, if you count all those up, including the first one, the spirit of I am, there are seven spirits. I'm just thinking that perhaps those define those seven spirits that Jesus is talking about and the Holy Spirit himself. So when Jesus begins his letter to the church in Sardis, he is calling special attention to the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of God. In Matthew 12, verse 22, it says this, reading through verse 32. Actually, we'll read through um, 37, I think. Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him, so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, Another word for Satan. By whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Jesus is saying that I have bound the strong man. I have bound Satan. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, 
the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. People call that the unforgivable sin. It's not forgiven in this age or the age to come. And that's because people who blaspheme the Holy Spirit will not be included in the first resurrection. And we will talk more about that as we continue in this um, letter to Sardis. In the last couple of videos, I was describing the church of Thyatira and how I saw that church as the type of church that I would describe as a charismatic church. I think the Church of Pergamum also fits that category because in both of those you have false prophets. The spirit of Balaam, the spirit of Jezebel. And now I think Sardis even continues with that idea of false prophets. In the last two videos, I specifically called out someone who is, has become popular as uh, being someone who casts out demons by the name of Greg Locke. I don't think that he speaks by the Spirit of God. I don't believe that he is casting out demons by the Spirit of God. If you listen to one of the videos that I linked, the one where he's talking about identifying three witches in his congregation, you'll see that he begins that talk by swearing upon the Bible and even calls down a curse upon himself and says, God, strike me dead if I'm lying. What did Jesus say about things like that? Matthew 5, verse 33, he said, Again, you have heard that it was said of those to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all. Don't swear by the Bible, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. So where did... Greg Locke's idea to swear by the Bible and call down a curse upon himself if he was lying. Where did that come from? Jesus says it came from the evil one. In James chapter 5, verse 12, But above all, my brothers, above all, but above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Above all. Wow. Well, I thought I was set to do this topic on blasphemy of the Holy Spirit last week and then suddenly some new information came to me concerning a group called the New Apostolic Reformation. 
And before I begin to talk about them, that group of people, let me just say this about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I used to define it simply as when you call evil good and good evil, you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And that's because what you're doing is you're saying that what God calls good, I call evil. What I call evil, God calls good. That's what that literally means. So you you are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. In this example that I just read from Matthew chapter 12, what you had is that the Pharisees said that what Jesus was doing in healing someone was done by the demonic spirit, not by the Holy Spirit. So that's the definition that Jesus gives us in Matthew chapter 12. But the converse of that, I think, is also blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And that is, when you say that you are doing things by the Holy Spirit, and you're really doing things by the demonic spirit, that is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I believe that that's what Greg Locke is doing. And... I believe that that's what the new apostolic reformation prophets and apostles are doing. I'm going to put a link to several of their uh, of art- several articles that deal with that group and the people who, who identify with that group as being part of that group. I know at least four of those people personally. They, they are people I have alluded to in previous videos that I've done about the charismatic church that I came out of. Actually, no, I know way more than four. Um, and have been pretty close to uh, at least two of them. And this information concerning the new apostolic reformation, very heavy on my heart. It's very sad that the part of, a part of the church, a large part of the church, that represents itself as doing mighty works in the name of Jesus is actually operating by the demonic spirit. I had to leave that church in 1993. And I still fellowshiped with believers who were really part of that whole movement until 1999, I think it was, maybe even early 2000, but right around 1999. It was in 1997 that God began to show me through the scripture many errors in my theology, any many errors in my thinking and my understanding of what the scripture was about. And Jesus' words to the church of Sardis, I think will help us to come back to where we ought to be. He says this, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive. 
that you are dead. I know your works. You know, these churches, believe me, when you look and see who is involved in this, you will probably be shocked. Because they have the reputation of being alive. They really do. I can tell you that when I went to that church, I bragged about it being alive. I really thought it was alive. And it took me a long time to wake up to the deception in it. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive. But you are dead. You are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Wake up. These churches are all calling for a great end time revival. New prophecies all the time of the glory coming and what God's going to do. These self-proclaimed apostles and prophets rely upon spiritual experiences that they believe come from the Holy Spirit. Many of them see angels. Many of them have visions. Many of them receive what they believe are prophecies. If you examine their prophecies, you'll find that most, if not all, fail. Most of these people were very ardently pro-Trump and were all prophesying that Trump would win the last election and even after he didn't, that he was going to be restored, that the election was going to be um, overturned quickly and by the time of inauguration in January. Well, that didn't happen, but it was prophesied by many. These people proclaim that they can appear in the courts in heaven and make decrees in the court of heaven that affect the earth. These people would be the people that Paul says are super apostles. Let's look at some of the things Paul says about the super apostles. It's in uh, the book of 2 Corinthians. Takes up about three chapters. 2 Corinthians 10 to um, 12. I'll start just at the beginning. I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Always by Christ. I, who am humble when face to face with you, bold toward you when I'm away. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. Verses the Spirit. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ. 
being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Take every thought captive to obey Christ. That's what Paul is always doing. So what does he do? He tells us what Christ thinks. He doesn't spend his time talking about visions and angels, angelic experiences, or the number of demons that he's cast out. He tells us about taking every thought captive to Christ. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters, for they say his letters are weighty and strong, bodily presence is weak, and his speech is of no account. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. This is a very elite group. I've known the names, many of the names in this group for 30 years. And those names that I learned 30 years ago are still there. And all of these so-called apostles and prophets always measure themselves by each other and they always compare themselves with each other and they always commend each other to each other. In other words, they are their own clique. Oh, I receive you as an apostle brother. I receive you as a prophet brother. I can tell that God's anointing is on you. This is what they do. It's a special club. And you're not in it. You're not as spiritual as them. Oh, how could you be? How could you be that spiritual? You don't get visions. You don't see angels. How could you be as spiritual as they are? Very, very select group of leaders and what do they do? By their being so select, they continue the Nicolaitan error, error, the clergy laity error. They are the clergy. They are the leaders. They are the apostles. They are the prophets. One thing you will see very, very common to these people. And you go to any of their websites, they're always monetized, they're always making money, they're always selling something, they're always asking for donations. They're always seeking gain from their prophecies. Back in the early 90s, just before I left this church, left this movement, and I didn't even know it was a movement then, may not have been called by this name then. We had huge conferences all the time, and I, I came up with a term called Big Event Theology. Big Event Theology. Total waste of time. Nothing spiritual ever happened, even though they said things did. No miracles, never saw one in my life. And I'm not saying God doesn't do miracles. I know he does. I know God is still alive and well and on planet Earth and he still moves by his Holy Spirit and he still speaks by his Spirit.
to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them, Isaiah says in chapter 8. To the law and to the testimony. I asked one of these men in 91, 92, or 93, why don't you ever preach from the law? And he said, the people are too grumpy to hear it. Too grumpy to hear God's word? I don't think so. I do not think so. What the people are starving for is God's word. So Paul continues on in chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians, verse 13. But we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you. For we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. For we do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others, but our hope is is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged, so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. This is the key. Does your preacher have as the goal to present you as a pure virgin to Christ? Do you have as the goal of your reading the word of God to be a pure virgin to Christ? Remember Revelation 14, the 144,000 were found to be virgins. This is talking about your spiritual purity because they're the only ones who make it. They're the only ones who make the first cut. The first resurrection. The overcomers. Every one of the letters Jesus wrote to the churches always says to the one who overcomes. The church doesn't teach that, do they? They teach that everyone's the same. If you simply name the name of Jesus, if you simply proclaim that Jesus is the Christ, you will be saved. And you don't have to do anything else. No pressure. Come as you are. Stay as you are. No pressure. You can even lead the church and be the worst practicing sinner there is. It's okay because Jesus nailed the law to the cross and there is no law. Do what you want. That's much of the church's theology in it. It's ridiculous. So, chapter 11, verse 3. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, Another Jesus. Hmm. Remember Matthew 24? Jesus said, many will come saying, I am the Christ. But they will deceive many. They'll come and say Jesus was the Christ. They do, but they deceive many. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, what, what did they receive? They received the Holy Spirit. Have you received the Holy Spirit? It's possible to receive a demonic spirit. 
or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted. A different gospel. What is the gospel? That Jesus died for my sins. That I am to continue to keep myself clean by repentance and faith that his death covered my sins. And therefore, by his resurrection, I also will be resurrected. So, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Super apostles? Did you know that we had Superman in the Bible? Super apostles. Indeed, I consider that I am not the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preach God's gospel to you free of charge. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained, and I will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. But why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. But what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. So these super apostles that Paul mentions, he now calls them false apostles. And not only that, he calls them Satan's servants. It's a sad, sad thing to think that there are so many in the world today that use the name of Christ for gain, proclaiming that there's something in spiritual power when they are not. But you know, that's exactly what Jesus describes in Matthew 24. Now, the last few videos I've read, uh, the whole book of Jude, and um, I believe it's 2 Peter chapter 2, that's very similar to the book of Jude, which describe how men secretly crept in to the church to pervert the gospel. I'm going to skip a few things where Paul goes on. Then chapter 12. I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. And Paul doesn't utter them, does he? On behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. 
You know, you go on to that supernatural where some of these men go on from time to time to boast about their visions and their angelic experiences. And you can just see the crowd eating it up. Oh, it's so, oh, it's so spiritual. But never a word about how to be pure before Christ. Never a word about how to have pure garments. But always a word about the latest book I wrote, the latest group of CDs I'm selling that have all of my visions and prophecies on them. Anything for gain. He heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about it, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I've been a fool. You forced me to it. For I ought to have been commended by you. For I was not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. I've been around these super apostles for years. I never saw a sign. I never saw a wonder. I never saw a mighty work. For in what were you less favored than the rest of the churches, except that I myself did not burden you? Forgive me this wrong. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. Paul does not go on about his visions. He simply tells us the truth. The things that God wants us to know in order to walk humbly before him in righteousness and truth. So now going back to Revelation 3, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. What is Christ's word here? To you, you apostles, self-proclaimed apostles and prophets in the New Apostolic Reformation, I knew you. You loved the Word of God. 
Remember what you received and heard. Remember the word of God. Keep it and repent. Repent. Keep God's word and repent. Stop believing a lie about an end time revival that no scripture says is going to happen. Because if you will not wake up, you cannot see the time you're in. And I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you because you did not discern the times that you live in. You have believed a lie. You have believed a lying spirit and you have spoken from a lying spirit. By following the lying spirit, you have blasphemed my spirit. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So, the super apostles that Paul speaks of have soiled their garments. The people that stay in their churches have soiled their garments. Paul says, I preached to present you pure in Christ. so that you would never appear with soiled garments. Three, five of Revelation, the one who overcomes will be clothed thus in white garments and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So you don't believe this. You don't believe that Jesus would ever blot anyone out of the book of life. But he says so right here. If you overcome, I will never blot your name out of the book of life. If you do not overcome, I will blot your name out of the book of life. Well, how do I overcome? How can I be an overcomer? It's very simple. Keep Christ's word and repent. Repent of your sins. Repent and be baptized. Repent of your sins. Wash yourself with Christ's word all the time. Wash yourself with his word. You will be white as snow. But if, if I begin to seek spiritual experiences, for the sake of spiritual experiences, so that I then can become popular and part of this clique. And then I become commended by them because I've got some experiences like they do. Wasn't that cool? I saw this angel. Let me tell you what he looked like. If I go to church all the time and I tell my spiritual experiences, 
people gain nothing. The people only gain when they are washed in the word of God. That's the only way to be an overcomer. You don't have to be a super apostle, super pastor, super anything. You just need to be a sheep who hears your master's voice. My sheep hear my voice, Jesus says. Do you hear Christ's voice? How, how did you go astray, you so-called apostles and prophets? How did you begin to listen to other voices besides Christ? Was it pride? Was it something that you, you wanted to be somebody, looked up to? the man that everybody wants to listen to. Father in heaven, I pray that you will bring repentance to those who have gone astray. I pray that you will bless these people in whatever movement because there's way more movements <coughs> than the new apostolic reformation there's so many false charismatic movements out there But that's not to defend others that are not charismatic because there's a lot of you who are not charismatic who have also lived to make names for yourself. Named colleges and books and ministries after yourselves. And so you've taken people's eyes off of Jesus and put them on yourself. You need to repent too. And most of you, if not all, suffer from incredible, incredibly bad theology because you don't even know, you don't even understand the doctrine of the salvation of the soul or the restoration of all things. As the writer of Hebrews said in chapter 5, I want to explain some things to you that are the meat of God's word, but I can't because you're still a babe. You need milk and not solid food because you have not learned to discern between good and evil. You've not learned to discern how the Word of God, how the Word of God divides between soul and spirit, that there is a difference between the soul and the spirit, that there is the salvation of the soul, which is different from the salvation of the spirit. Some of you have written books that condemn all charismatics and you know maybe uh, certainly most of what you said was true I remember one book called Charismatic Chaos and it certainly was true John MacArthur I think it was who wrote, wrote that and John has written some good things but he doesn't understand the salvation of the soul and other things. So, but, but, you don't get in 
because of your correct doctrine. That's not what qualifies you. You get in only one way. Jesus. The blood of Jesus. By the word of your testimony, because you did not love your life unto death. Revelation 12, 11. That's the overcomer. You wash yourself with the word of God. You maintain your white clothes by always looking to Jesus to forgive you of your sins. You repent of your sin as soon as you know that you've sinned. And then you will make it. You will be an overcomer. 